Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. How should the Bible's addressees understand the parable of the wise and foolish virgins at the outset of Matthew chapter 25? In what way does the metaphor of the lamp oil relate to the story of the foolish stewards? How does the marketplace, first mentioned in chapter 20, frame our understanding of the final judgment and the commandment to care for the weaker neighbor? This week's discussion challenges popular interpretations of Lenten piety and raises questions about the way in which Christians identify with current events. You're listening to the Bible as literature. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 57 of the Bible as Literature podcast this past weekend. Rich, you gave a sermon on the last judgment. That was the theme of the weekend. You talked about different things. You talked about the gospel text, which of course is Matthew 25, the famous text. You dealt a little bit with Paul's letter to the Corinthians and meat offered to idols. But along the way, in your discussion of Matthew, you started elaborating on the question of the wise virgins and the foolish virgins. And it kind of left people standing there wondering what to do next. So you want to talk a little bit about what you said this weekend? Sure. In looking at the context of the gospel of the last judgment, you know, if you helped the ones who were needy, you're a sheep. If you didn't, you're a goat. And that's the only offering to God. But the beginning of chapter 25, you have the wise and the foolish virgins, those who are waiting for the bridegroom to come. Some of them had oil. Some of them did not have oil. And then following that, you had the pericope about the wise and the foolish stewards, the ones who were given coins. Some of them invested them and some of them buried them. And I realized something that in the pericope of the wise and the foolish virgins, it doesn't explain the oil metaphor. A lot of times we talk about being ready for when the bridegroom comes. But what is it exactly? Are we supposed to be praying a lot? Are we supposed to be waiting vigilantly, lighting our lamps and looking to see if he's coming and that's why we need this? We need to be aware of our way or whatever. What happens is because there's this ambiguity in the text, our mind starts going to try and fill in these ambiguities. So it's like, okay, well then what's the oil? Because I want to be a smart virgin. I don't want to be a dumb virgin. Get me that oil and I will do the right thing. I mean, this is the typical way that us Pharisaical Christians will think because we need to go find the box so that we can put our check mark in it. I want that oil, but it doesn't say what the oil is. So what do we do? Matthew leaves that open to us and there's an ambiguity. We then move to the next pericope, the wise and foolish stewards. The wise stewards invest the money and the foolish one hides it. So why? Why is this important? If the master is entrusting something to people, okay, I want to do the right thing. I want to be the good guy. I want to be the ones who invest. I don't want to be the one who buries it. First of all, this enlightens a bit the first pericope. Okay, I want to get that oil. I want to make sure I've got it in my top drawer of my nightstand just in case the bridegroom comes sometime over the next however many years. I want it there, ready. But then the next one says, okay, you aren't allowed to just sit on this coin, dumb steward. You have to invest it like the smart ones did. You have to constantly be putting it out there and risking it and investing it and giving it and seeing what you can get out of it. And there's a whole complex process. You aren't allowed just to sit on it. So that enlightens a little bit what we understand the oil to be. The oil can't be something that we just get and sit on. Once you've checkmarked this box, it's not enough. Because if that were the case, then the fact that the guy gave back the coin, well, you asked for the coin, I gave you the coin back, master. Where does the oil come from? We don't know. It doesn't say in that pericope of the wise and foolish virgins. They have to go and buy it. Oh, you can go to the store, you can buy it anytime. You can go to the market, they sell it there. 
just go and get it. It seems readily available. Whereas in the case of the coin, it's very specifically given by the master. Correct. And I guess we're assuming that the oil is provided by God. Somehow you're supposed to go out and do something and get it because the wise virgins went and got theirs ahead of time. The foolish virgins just waited till the last minute to get it. And, you know, one could say it has to do with prudence or something like that, but that falls a little bit flat when you're trying to think of this as a metaphor of the kingdom, a mm-hmm. parable of the kingdom. So then finally we get to this pericope of the last judgment where one is required to be giving to the poor, to the needy, and not performing those actions keep us out of the kingdom. This is the only thing that matters. Are you helping the needy or are you not helping the needy? Now, oftentimes we who are Pharisaic and like to call ourselves practically minded, we say, well, we can't just give everything away because, you know, that would be foolish. Whereas at the beginning of Jesus's words in the book of Matthew, he's saying, don't worry about it. (laughs) He's saying the lilies of the field, they've got clothes, the sparrows, they've got food. So why would you be lacking in food and clothing? So don't worry about it. But what's the one thing we do have to be concerned about food and clothing for is for the needy. That is everything that matters, not just important, it's everything. So this then gives us an idea of what is important about the oil. The oil is the actions that we are performing on behalf of the poor, i.e. God, as you've done this to them, so you've done it to me. This is the only offering we can give to God. And so in the pericope then of the wise and foolish stewards, what is the thing that we're supposed to be constantly doing, constantly investing? Those things that are given to us, we have to constantly have them out there. We have to constantly be giving those things. Just because we're given something doesn't mean, okay, we've got it now. No, it means now you have an obligation to go and give it to the needy. In fact, I've noticed this in looking at how sacrifices function and prosperity functions in the prophets. Because you're prosperous, the natural human reaction is to hold on to it. I mentioned on Sunday, it's like God is watering the field with a river, with a stream. But we've got our field, and so we put dams on it to make sure that our field has enough without respecting the people who are downstream. This is what prosperity is. Prosperity is what continually comes to us from God that we then invest in others by offering it and giving it up for the sake of the other. And this is what makes us the wise virgin as opposed to the foolish virgin that we have prepared ourselves by continually doing these actions. But that's my question. Did God provide the oil or do you get it yourself? I think that this is an important question because I think everyone assumes that you're supposed to get the oil yourself, which is why it goes back to the tension you set up at the start of the podcast. Well, how much do I need to get and how does it work? But when you bring in the metaphor of the steward and the coin, it's very clear that the coin was provided. So where does the oil come from? We're saying we don't know where it comes from, but isn't there enough from the context to say that God provides the oil? So yeah, let's look at the context. In the parable of the Last Judgment, it doesn't say where your food has come from. It doesn't say where your clothing has come from. You've got it. Maybe it's irrelevant where it comes from. I think, though, in the broader context of Matthew, it does say, when you have the story of the lilies of the field, it's pretty clear that in Matthew, you can't make one hair on your head white or black. So that's what I'm saying. Like, if you look at the broader Methan context, everything that you have that's good comes from God. Everything that you've done that's evil comes from you. I think people typically, when they hear the story of the wise and foolish virgins, just assume that these schmucks didn't plan ahead and they got screwed. And I think that there's something to that, actually, because the planning ahead is about making correct choices in advance of the day. Where did you invest your time? Did you invest your time in the study of Torah, hence the five lamps? Or did you invest your time in other things? And so if you invest your time in the study of Torah, you will know what to say on that day. You will know what to do on that day. And the knowing what to do and the knowing what to say comes with the practice of the precepts of the Torah, which would lead you to do what is being outlined in Matthew 25, which is a mini Torah. It's a regurgitation of the law of Moses, essentially. And I think that's important because 
in the pericope of the last judgment, nobody knew they were doing the right thing or not doing the wrong thing. They, but, but I think someone who's studying Torah does know. Paul has this expression that no one can make any judgment before the time. He won't even judge himself before the time. So I think that people who read Torah know that they're supposed to take care of the needy neighbor. But whether or not they have been taking care of the needy neighbor, that will be revealed on that day. But the fact of the matter is, if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, which is studying the text and then trying to live the text and bear witness to the text, that choice to make God's teaching the source of your life is what puts the oil in your lamp. Oil is a metaphor for mercy. Oil is a metaphor for life, just in the ancient world, generally speaking. So it's this life and this mercy that flows from the teaching. Either you're carrying the lamp of the Torah or you're carrying your own lamp, which is, you know, right. it's not going to have enough sustenance for you. So the fact that all these parables in this chapter focus on the actions that one is taking, I mean, the fact that the unwise steward sits on his coin that was given to him rather than investing and going and doing something with it. You know, the action that you're supposed to be taking is taking care of the needy neighbor. This chapter itself doesn't talk about the motivation or where that's coming from, but we can see elsewhere that this is where one gets the teaching. This is where one, you know, if we take a Methan line, thy will not mine be done. God gives us the thing that sustains us and we do not do our own will, but we do God's will. So ultimately, what is God's will? The only thing that matters in the end, at the end of Matthew 25, is did you take care of the needy neighbor? Even if you were studying Torah and you didn't come to fruition and perform those actions, then it's of no good anyway. I think that's what it means to sit on the coin. I think what's interesting about the metaphor of the lamps and the virgins is that you carry a lamp in order to light the path that you're walking on. In the story, they're walking up to the gates of the master's house, a metaphor for the kingdom or or whatever. So to be able to get there and have enough oil implies the need to act in a certain way in order to achieve certain things. So the study of Torah and the action aren't necessarily two separate things. I think that's the point. The study and the walking, they go hand in hand, the halakha. But it's the law. You walk according to this teaching and so forth. You draw this parallel between the two, and I think there are parallels, but there are differences too, and I think the differences are important. There is a slight difference. It's a thematic critique, but there are slight differences. Yeah, actually, in the first one, they're sitting and not getting something. In the second one, they got something, and then they sat on it. But the ones who are wise in both pericopes are the ones who ahead of time were prepared by getting the oil and going to the market and doing what they needed to do. And then the second one, the wise stewards are the ones who went to the marketplace and went and traded. So the ones who are getting off their duffs and going and doing something. Well, I think there's something more. If it's the market in both examples, what does the marketplace represent? Is the marketplace where you interact with the nations? It's the marketplace where you interact with people of all walks of life, of all different social classes and so forth. Is that what's happening there? I think so. I think that going into the marketplace does represent going out and mixing with other people. That's what the marketplace is. It's where everybody is. It's where everything is happening. It's the center of the town. Right. Um, as you can see in Athens to this day, you know, it's the center. In Athens, it's the high place. It's in the center. If you go to other places in the Middle East, that's where the center is. Well, this is a very difficult reading then for people who are advising each other not to go shopping during Lent. If your take on Lent and on piety focuses on becoming more inward looking, more insular, more focused on the inner life of your community and leads you to pull away from the marketplace, then technically the way that you're approaching the fast is in opposition to Matthew's admonition with these metaphors. Exactly. The fast is always described as fasting from food, extra prayer, and almsgiving, always in that order. Significantly, the reading we have at the beginning of Lent is that all that matters is alms. That's it. I mean, that's Matthew 25. It's all that matters is alms. And as you mentioned, talking about 1 Corinthians, this is my favorite reading of the entire liturgical year. At the beginning of Meat Fair, we read Paul's epistle where he says, doesn't matter if you eat meat or not. That's what we read right before Meat Fair. 
So why would he say that? Why would we read this? If your eating offends somebody, then by no means should you eat. Fasting is only functional when it applies to someone that might be scandalized, the weaker brother. So the parallel you have in the epistle and in the gospel is that your only job is to help the weaker. That's it. And so if by fasting you can help the weaker, by all means you should fast. If by fasting you don't help the weaker, it doesn't matter if you do it or not. As long as your ego doesn't get puffed up, do something, but it doesn't matter really. Because Matthew 25 is the only thing. Like that's the thing that's so shocking about this chapter in my opinion, is that it's so simple and what it's saying, taking care of the needy is what matters. There's the context that's created by the lectionary, but then there's the context that's imposed by the author of Matthew. And if we look at the latter context, the context of Matthew, it's taking care of the weaker brother, but again, taking care of the weaker brother in the marketplace, at least in the way that you've laid out these two parables, the wise and foolish virgins, and then the story of the stewards. And I think this brings an important added tension to the discussion because people will tend to hear that you have to take care of the weaker brother and then they'll look to the weaker brother in their immediate family, in their tribe, in their church community. I mean, we like to talk about certain cultures as being tribal, but generally speaking, American Christians are extremely ruthlessly tribal, no matter which denomination or which church, because when they hear about the importance of taking care of one another, they think first of their community, and they become inward-looking and insular. I think that by forcing oneself to look at the marketplace, you suddenly realize what Paul is saying in Galatians, that you have to prioritize the household of faith, but the household of faith is not about your clique or your ghetto or the community in which you reside. The household of faith is the one that encompasses all of God's children. It's much broader than your insular community. So I'm saying that the scandal of these readings goes beyond Paul's admonition about meat. This strikes people's ears because everyone is preoccupied with what they're going to eat for the next you know, 50 days. But the reality is the greater sin, I think, with respect to Lent and common piety is that all of the activities of Lent force you to look inward at your own community, the ritual practices of your own community, and your personal needs on your Lenten journey, whatever that means, and you completely transgress the law of God in doing so. Yeah, the Lenten journey idea would work if we only had the first part of the Last Judgment where he says, every time you did this, you did this to me. And everyone say, oh, wonderful, every time I did that. But the goats say, every time you did not do this, to the least of my brethren. You did not do it to me. So if at this moment you're not doing it, you're not taking care of someone who's naked or hungry or in prison, you have just wasted an opportunity. So you better get off your bottom quickly to go find somebody. But get off your bottom. I'm going to just repeat this point. Get off your bottom and go out into the world. Go as far as you can. Out. You have to go out into the world, into the marketplace. The emphasis, I think, is you have to get out of your ghetto. You have to get out of your tribe. If you're just taking care of the people in your group, it is no credit to you. And it is even less credit if you're attending to your own, quote, spiritual needs during Lent. I really want to emphasize this as a priest because I think that the message that we hear very often in churches across all denominations is a counter message. It's a counter gospel message. This is your time to look at your own spiritual journey, your own needs, to grow closer as a community, to spend more time together going to services and different things. That's not what Matthew says. There's one spiritual need. That's taking care of the needy. It's taking care of the needy, but also in Matthew, forcing yourself to look outward for those in need. You know, we used to say at seminary, it's not about the neighbor, it's about the needy neighbor. And then it's not just about the needy neighbor, it's about the weaker needy neighbor. I think I want to add something to this definition of neighbor that we talk about in the gospel. It's the needy, weaker neighbor who is outside the border of the land in which you dwell. The outsider. The outsider. Taking care of the needy person or the weaker person is always correct, no matter where they're located. But the gospel is forcing you to stop thinking about your group 
because ultimately life comes not just from lifting up the needy, but from lifting up the needy outside whom you fear, you hate, you despise, or with whom you are in competition. It's putting the needs of those people first. And the way that I would frame this in terms of the last couple of weeks, I mean, the news about ISIS, the outcome of the wars of the past decade, and the place they've led us to now in the Middle East, it's very distressing. And the temptation is, each time something terrible happens, the temptation on Facebook is for people to talk about the tragedy impacting their group. Christians are killed and people want to talk about the tragedy of Christian slaughter. And they play actually into the game of the militants and they start giving themselves over to this emotive symbolism about Christian martyrdom. And the same can be said about all of the other categories that are impacted. But I think Christians in particular are susceptible to the language of martyriology and emoting about what's happened and seeing the entire burden of suffering in the Middle East through this myopic perspective of just the martyrdom of the Christians. And I think it's at that moment that those of us who take the gospel seriously have to start talking about the Muslims that have suffered whether it's these beautiful, beautiful young adults, you know, this young couple in their 20s and their sibling that were murdered in Chapel Hill, or it's, you know, literally the thousands upon thousands and thousands of people in places like Syria or Iraq, who even before ISIS came on the scene, their lives were destroyed. Because I think that there is a difference between feeling compassion towards a Christian in jeopardy whom you identify with in terms of the fruit that it could bear for the life of the world and looking to take care of the needy one in what is perceived psychologically at least as the enemy camp. I think that's the deeper wisdom at work here in this text. Anyways, those are my thoughts. Thank you, Father. Thanks very much. You take care. Have a good week. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.